Robot Talk is the podcast that sits down with robot enthusiasts from around the world and asks them the questions you always wanted answered. Like, how can the robot tell that I'm really me? And how does that thing work? Hello, everyone. Welcome to Robot Talk. I'm your host, Claire Asher. And this week's episode is all about cybersecurity and how we safeguard privacy for healthcare and assistive robots. But first, I'd like to remind you to subscribe to Robot Talk through your favourite podcast provider. It really helps the podcast and means you'll be the first to hear the latest episodes. Another way to find out about new episodes is our email newsletter, which you can sign up to on our website by going to robottalk.org. So, with all that said, it's time for me to introduce this week's guest. I recently had a really interesting conversation with Jims Ma Chang from Sheffield Hallam University, all about security, privacy, and trust in healthcare robots. This week, I'm talking to Jims Ma Chang, a senior lecturer and researcher at Sheffield Hallam University, whose work focuses on building secure, private, user-centric solutions for healthcare technologies and robotic systems. Hi, Jims. Lovely to have you on Robot Talk. Hi, Claire. Thank you for having me here. So you lead an intelligent and secure cybersecurity research group known as ISEC CyberNet. Can you tell me a bit about what you and your group are working on currently? Uh, Yes, Claire. So we as a team are working on various security and privacy-related projects in the field of IoT, IOMT, and uh, multimodal assistive robotic system. Um, you mentioned um, IoT, which yeah. is Internet of Things. Yes, and that's then right. IOMT, what's that? The Internet of Medical Things. So okay. the, the device to monitor, to control, probably in the future, will be monitored from an NHS hospital sitting at home. Mm. And this is going to really become a reality uh, in the near future. One such project is on improving quality living for hearing impaired or those who have hearing difficulties. And globally, interestingly, the United Nations states that over 1.5 billion people are living with hearing loss. Our recent estimate also shows that this number could grow up to 2.5 billion by the end of this decade, 2030. And as for the UK, the UK Health Security Agency states that there are over 11 million people across the UK living with hearing loss. So uh, this project is going to be interesting because it's going to develop a secure engagement and interactive system with the smart home for those who have hearing impaired or have having difficulties to support and improve their independent uh, quality living, Mm. uh, have a better social engagement and interaction, and be able to communicate probably for the emergency condition and services. At the moment, it's very, very, uh, how do we say, not good as we would be expecting with this 21st century. (laughs) So there are a lot of things that we need to do over there. And there are other projects, including working on developing a continuous authentication technique for a care robot using gate-based biometric uh, authentication of a user so that the user need not remember the passcode or password uh, in order to you know, uh, get into the system to extract mm. the services of the care robot. So um, for listeners who aren't maybe familiar, gate is kind of how you hold yourself, how you move, how you walk. Yeah. The challenge here is about using the way how we are collecting that gate in order to do the authentication. Most of the scenario, people tend to work with a a kind of an environment that is already planned. But in real life Mm -hmm. scenario, it will not be the case. You know, I may have to walk upstairs. I might have to run to reach home. So will I still be able to authenticate? You know, will I be authenticated by the care robot in those scenario on those cases? Maybe I'm carrying some objects. Maybe I'm carrying a bag. So probably my gait pattern might change. Maybe my health over a period of time changed or something happened to my health and it could probably affect my gait pattern. So will I still be able to authenticate this particular user that I'm talking about as uh, as a patient? So that is the question that we are looking at. And in fact, at the moment, we are using uh, a smart device in order to collect this gate data. But in the future, we are looking for the robot to collect it rather than we supplying the information mm. to the robot. Probably just like the MoveNet, the force detection model, 
that we have uh, already. So probably that would be the way forward because if we say you have to make it work if you have the smart system, what if the smart system or the smart watch that the user is having, you know, is not uh, running or it's, mm. uh, it's lost or it's broken or it didn't charge up. So there will be an issue. So instead of using a smart device, probably we are looking in the future, letting the robot to do the gate analysis or gate detection or uh, uh, collecting the data directly from the robot itself. So the main idea is to reduce the human error because the care robot that we'll be developing will be generally used by probably children or older generation yeah. or have a disability. How do we ask them to remember password? How do we ask them to scan the fingerprint? So all these instructions requires new skill set, probably uh, knowledge in order to interact and engage. So we don't want that to happen. Interestingly, 95% of the cybersecurity incidents are due to human error <laughs> reported by IBM. That's a very, very high number. <laughs> yeah. so we are really looking or aiming at how can we reduce this? You know, How can we avoid from uh, occurring any kind of uh, cyber incident in general. If we use a fingerprint, it can be copied, voice, it can be generated using AI. If mm. it is a face, it can still be replicated with a 3D modeling and so on. So it's becoming really challenging for the authentication. So probably gate is one way, but uh, we have to really investigate to see if that's the real way of authenticating a user. So those are some of the things that we are doing uh, within our research field. I'm fascinated by this idea of gate-based authentication. Um, is, is that really that unique between different people? It is. Like, you know, with this project, as we are doing a study, like, it, it is fascinating to see the uniqueness of your, even your hand movement, the way mm. you rotate. Uh, also, like, we were thinking that if we are of the same height uh, or the same weight, the way that we walk will be the same. But actually, that's not the case. It's so unique. Probably that's one of the things like why if I see you from behind, yeah. I don't see your face, but still I'll be able to recognize and say, I think that's Claire walking down the street. So this gate is so unique and our eye can probably perceive, understand it. Uh, so I believe that AI and robotic, you know, if we train it very properly, we'll be able to understand the uniqueness of our gate in terms of the way we move, the way we live the way the way we turn so i think it will have that uniqueness and it does uh, generate the uniqueness with the current work that we are doing hmm. it goes up to uh, you know like 99 percent accuracy it is very really? fascinating to see wow yeah that's amazing and yeah like you said maybe we're using that information in our day-to-day -day lives but we're certainly not usually conscious of it that's true so as we've mentioned um one area you're working on is securing and safeguarding privacy for robotic systems particularly in the healthcare sector. So um, can you talk a little bit about some of the biggest challenges in security and privacy for care robots? Yeah, it's, it's very fascinating uh, because like when we talk about the care robot, it's a robot that we are interacting and engaging face to face. Now, if I was using probably a tablet or a phone or an app, probably I can encrypt and send, you know, and maintain and preserve data confidentiality when I'm interacting and engaging with this robot. Unfortunately, when we are doing life like this face to face, how do we encrypt the information? Like mm -hmm. everybody can see and hear what is going on. If we can't do an uh, encryption or if we can't maintain a data confidentiality, then we must find a different way on how to maintain that confidentiality when we are interacting and engaging with the robot because the information is sensitive and private in nature when we talk of a user on healthcare related domain. So if this is not possible, probably when we are interacting and engaging with the robot, uh, uh, one of the ways could be letting this robot to really understand the social and cultural awareness or the context so that the robot will be able to find ways to say, okay, okay, this is time for me to talk. I think I should keep my mouth shut or probably I should limit myself of what I can say, where I can say and how much I can say. Mm -hmm. So probably that's one way of looking for how to maintain that privacy and then confidentiality. But that's going to be very complex because we have to let this robot understand the social context, the cultural aspect and yeah. so on. And then unintentional and inappropriate data disclosure will be another real challenge that we have to look into. The question is, how do we do that? So it means that we must kind of discipline the robot uh, so that it knows what to say, when to say, and where to say, and so on. So other security challenges obviously include the access control. So because there will be so many different stakeholders that will be engaging and participating with this robot, mm. if that is the case, how do we control this access? You know, what mechanism and technique do we use in order to control the access? Maybe a doctor or a nurse or a carer, a friend or a family or myself, you know, as mm. the main user, you know, how do we control that access so that my privacy is protected and preserved? 
And a continuous authentication is one really big issue that we really have to address because it's when we are getting a service from a robot, it's not about just authenticated once and then you know uh, keep getting the service. What if the users have walked upstairs? What if the user has just walked outside the house? So that continuity uh, uh, of detecting, recognizing, and understanding that I am you know the owner or the authenticated user is around me is very very important. Otherwise, it would be like an open computer that is just left, you know, open, and then we just went somewhere. People mm. can just come in and then ask the service and temper it and so on. So think about your Alexa as well at home. You know, like if we just say Alexa, it wakes up, it's just throwing out all the information. Even if we put a password, let's say we have got into the system is authenticated. And if the system is not recognizing me continually, then someone else can come in and, you know, get extracting the services uh, that should not be uh, the case, but that will happen. And maintain data integrity and transparency and another aspect that we really need to take into account. So because the thing that the system is storing, is, you know, how reliable is this information? Has it been modified? Has it been tampered? Mm -hmm. So uh, is there some kind of immunity that we are providing so that nobody can change or alter this information? At the same time, any decision-making process or the activity that is recording and the decision that is making, if we don't make it transparent, how do we even know that he's making a right decision for us? Yeah. So there are all these issues that we really need to address. You know, So the traditional method of the security mechanism that we generally tend to apply might not work in certain scenario, in certain cases, depending on the nature of the data, nature of the interaction and engagement that we are doing with this robot. And there is another interesting uh, project where we are looking for a solution of a control of robotic services based on the role, the activity, and the preferences of the patient and the need of the information by these different stakeholders. So if, if not, it's going to be very difficult to really control the information. Now, if we look at the general method of how we control the access in terms of probably who can read this information, who can write this information, that might not really hold true because when I'm collecting a health data, so it will be a pool of data. So out of those pool of data, the doctor might need every detail about it, but probably the nurse would even understand, you know, what this data even means. So probably needs to understand a very high level meta information from that same pool of data. So the way how we control the access to provide based on the need, based on the role is going to be very critical, you know, mm -hmm. so that we really provide the real uh, meaningful a service to the user. Otherwise, we ask something and the robot keeps saying something else, which might not be meaningful to me. So we have to look into uh, that aspect. And this is necessary to make the user feel that he or she is in control of the robot as well. You know, that when we provide that preferences set by the user. So at the moment, you are letting me record this. So, <laughs> so kind of, I am kind of feel that whatever I'm saying, so I'm the one who have agreed to record this. Mm. So that kind of uh, control, I, if, if I feel it, probably I will be more confident as well on what I'm sharing, what I'm interacting and giving out or engaging uh, with, with the user. And in fact, it is becoming more complex when the access control is going to be executed from an unstructured data pool. So probably we are having a long conversation and the doctor comes in and he wants to extract only the information that he needs in particular, not the whole entire conversation, or maybe an, a voice audio that is recorded for the last 24 hours, but need only certain information out of this whole length 24 hour video or recording a recorded voice, mm. or it could be even a video in that matter. So those are the kind of thing that we are looking forward in future, how to train the robot to make the system or the robot understand. So that even if it is structured or unstructured, be able to still provide the service and not leaking out the information, which is not necessary. So only mm -hmm. giving out to what is needed and what is required as per the service and as per the role. Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated uh, issue, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it is true. It is really complicated if you look into it. Yeah. I'm just thinking like in terms of, you know, if I go and speak to my GP um, and, you know, obviously telling them kind of private information about my health and they consciously or unconsciously are then making all kinds of decisions about who to share that information with, how to share it, what pieces of information to share and which ones not to. And yeah, and yeah, that's, true. that's that's a lot to try and program into a robot when there's so many kind of situation specific elements to it. That, that, that's and it's going to be really complicated, Claire, if we look at it. Like, if I have to make it scalable and say, this robot is going to serve 10 people. So these 10 people, uniquely, I have to identify, mm -hmm. recognize, 
authenticated and know what information should be stored in which part of the database or the pool so that I don't mix up the information or I don't end up leaking someone else's information uh, to somebody else. You know? So it's going to be really complicated when we start looking into that multidimensional model to make it scalable. Yeah. But probably that's the way forward anyway. Otherwise, it's so expensive, we wouldn't be able to really adopt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess the, the kind of access element that you were talking about, um, obviously, it's really important that only the users who are supposed to access the robot and the data are able to. But it's also like frustrating as a user if you have to keep kind of logging in or whatever, if, if, if every five minutes it logs you out. So you've kind of got to balance that element of frustration. Exactly. That is where I was talking about that continuous authentication so yeah. that like the, the system knows that, okay, my owner is there right in front of me. Now I need to give the service. I'll be ready whenever he is ready. So kind of behind the scene is always checking who is in front of me, always mm. monitoring and seeing, you know, if my authenticated user is uh, the one requesting this service. So it's kind of a bit like an Alexa in a way. So it's silently listening until yeah. we say, Alexa, it wakes up. <laughs> so she, I say she because the voice is again. Yeah. <laughs> lady. So she, she wakes up not because it's it's not something like she wakes up when we call. It's like actually it's listening all the time, waiting yeah. for that code to be provided to, you know, to this system. So we must have a way to continuously monitor, uh, but at the same time, uh, not end up recording. So that's another danger that we have to know. Suppose like if I continuously monitor if someone else has walked by and I'm recording that as well. So what do I record and store? Like, so did they give me the permission to even record the information? You know, I was yeah. just passing by your door or your gate. So, so there, there are a lot of things that we really need to consider uh, when it comes to this uh, authentication and access control. It mm. wouldn't be just like say authenticated job done. So it will be kind of interwining and understanding each other uh, when, when do I wake up? When do I uh, scan? You know, when do I test? When do I check? So th there are all those things that need, really needs to be considered to make it a holistic, secure, you know, system that will really preserve the privacy of the user. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I certainly find it a little bit creepy, these kind of home assistants <laughs> that are always listening to you. That's true. That's true. Um, but I think a lot of people, when it's, you know, a sort of a box sat on their desk, they don't think about it that much, but maybe when it looks more humanoid, suddenly there's kind of, you you imbue it with all of these things. Oh, it's listening to me. What's it thinking? You know, is it recording yeah, this? That, that's true. Otherwise, it's like inside is the same <laughs> algorithm, same exactly. information. It's just the embodiment that makes it look appealing at the same time, more, uh, how do you say, friendly in a way. Yeah. To, to, to have that sense of, you know, oh, it's my friend or, you know, a pet or, so I think most of the robotic system, that's why they do all this embodiment to make it look like an animal, like a dog, like mm. a cat, or even like a human and so on. Yeah. And I guess, you know, an element of this at the moment is kind of, you'll say something in front of your home assistant and then suddenly all these adverts will pop up on your phone for <laughs> things that you've been talking about. And I guess that is we, true. You, you don't want that from a, a care assistant robot. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That that is one. That is one of the reasons why you know for us, we, well, those of us who are working in security. So when we say it's really important, uh, probably they think because we are working in the security, so we have to say it's important. <laughs> That's not really the case. You know, it's really important. You know, it, it was this uh, finance loan app that is running a scam in India at the moment. So this app, what, what they do is like, uh, you will be agreed to install it, obviously. We will say yes, accept the terms and condition, install. And then they will even sanction the loan literally within five minutes. But what this app does is hidingly access all the information off your phone and they can not only see, they can download, they can literally do anything okay from this app mm. so it, it's so scary to think about that they can see what we are doing you know, yeah. they, they can access all the videos the pictures all the context that we have you know just because i end up getting you know a, a, a little bit of a loan from somewhere yeah so this security aspect is something that we have to look at that's why our research group we emphasize on the secure by design and privacy by design approaches not something that we leave at the end but as we build this system, why don't we think it from the start so that everything is in debt? Yeah, yeah, that is really scary. These kind of issues of privacy are definitely things that I, I hear often when people think about care robots, um, especially true. ones that might be 
in the home kind of long term you know you're inviting mm. this this robot to share yeah. the most private aspects of your life um how do you think these issues kind of impact people's trust and their willingness to adopt technology that could be really helpful to them yeah so this that, that's a very interesting question uh, in fact you know uh, with this uh, one of our recent research finding which we presented in a white paper which was funded by the EPSRC UK RAS network on trust and adoption uh, which is really, in fact, going to be a real challenge because this care robot, as you say, is dealing with medical health, well-being, all the sensitive data of the patient. Not only the health, probably is interacting, engaging, because so mm. probably, in fact, could see, could hear literally everything. So if those things are all kind of recorded, if I have to filter it out, first I need to record in order to do the filtering. So yes. literally, I am absorbing all the information within that environment. So when we did this study, like literally 70%, of them says that RAS cannot be trusted if security and privacy is not put into place. So yeah. uh, probably there are some who say that, oh, that's fine. So there was this interesting question that was raised and say, you know, our phone, like with your, the SMS that we send, the phone that we are making, it's not encrypted and we have been using it. And probably we'll just continue to adopt as, you know, embrace this technology. But one thing that we have to remember is with the phone, I can control what I want to say. With the message, I can control what I want to write. Yeah. But with this care robot, as it's absorbing all our private information, like it's not me, but rather it is the robot really having all this pool of data and information. So if we really don't put the security and privacy aspect into place, then probably it will be very scary in terms of trust in the longer run, uh, especially when the information gets leaked out and so on. And 96% of the uh, user really thinks that in order to safeguard and protect the system, we must have these mechanisms in pertaining to security and privacy in place. And in fact, all of them, there were 30 of them, the participants, and then all of them really agree that to make a safe adoption of RAS, uh, uh, security is one of the key parameters and privacy is another aspect that we need to address. Otherwise, it will be a real challenge. In fact, it's very interesting. People may be even willing to risk and compromise, you know, uh, uh, based on the service that they are getting and receiving from the mm. care robot. But in the long run, acceptance and adoption will definitely be affected if the system cannot be trusted. So if the data can be tampered, the, the, that's very scary to even think of. Yeah. If the access is not controlled, it will be an open system, confidentiality not maintained, then definitely trust will be affected. Now, it's very interesting to note here, like when NHS, when we have this uh, 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 app that was built during the COVID, they first call it not test and trace, but it was track and trace, if you remember. Mm. And they said, the moment they said track and trace, everybody was worried. They said, who, how, why should they <laughs> track and trace me? And yeah. I have some of my friends who even uninstalled the app. So said, I don't want them to know where I go. So mm. definitely that was a big issue. And that perception, so that the government understood it. They changed nothing, but they just changed the name. And they said, Yes, and trust, and everybody yeah. seemed to accept it better. Just that perception. Forget about the real security, the privacy, and mm. the real trust. Even the perception can have an impact on the adoption. So if that is the case, so everybody everybody start talking about this robot, like so it's leaking out information all the time. Then do we really think we will be using it? I think that's something that we need to think about. Probably not, because it is directly dealing with our private and personal data. Mm. Yeah, that's such a good point. I guess the other side to this is you obviously you need the security and the privacy to be top notch, but you also need people to trust the company or, or whatever organization is responsible for implementing that, right? Like you That's could have true. done a great job, but if people don't trust that you've done a great job, then it's kind of meaningless. That, that's true. That's why IBM, uh, uh, you know, security export, they did a report and say, you know, brand attack. So there are cyber, you know, these uh, hackers, people were employed to attack on these big brands, yeah. you know, like so, so that they say, okay, we don't trust you, you know, how you record our information, how you maintain our information, just to damage the brand itself. So that itself is a big thing. Like we have heard about those millions of people whose data was compromised in terms of the Facebook. And then even I stopped posting anything after, after <laughs> they did that a couple of years ago. So it has that impact, you know, that when the brand is impacted. But, mm. but if, if we don't hear such thing, yes, there, there is definitely that acceptance to say, oh, we trust them. That, that, that kind of thing is definitely there. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is the most common like, misconception about robotics and cybersecurity? I think that's a that's the, probably one of the most interesting question uh, apart from what we have been discussing because it's very interesting what what people perceive and what a robot can do. 
uh, they assume or they tend to think that it can do many things and it's mm. so intelligent and it's almost like a human life. But actually, that is not true so far as my understanding, <laughs> you know, with all the research that we are doing or that I'm doing or my team is working on. Maybe that, that becomes true in the future, uh, but we are not there yet. And that's mm. not really true. So if we look at the human side, you know, that creativity, the innovation, the emotional intelligence, the ethics and morality, and then uh, solving new complex problem, uh, uh, you know, understanding the context, empathy, compassion. I think there are a lot of things that probably this robot may never have, you know, for the yeah. rest of the, I don't know, a thousand years to come. So the misconception is that, you know, probably because of all these amazing uh, sci-fi uh, yeah. movies, you know, that, oh, the robot can do this and do that. But actually, that's not the case in reality, uh, if we really look into it. And uh, I was listening to one of the talks and one neuroscientist, uh, she said, like, in order to power up our brain for the whole day, it needs only four banana. I said, <laughs> <laughs> only four banana to power up our human brain. And then that is literally computing, like, the, some of them say a billion, billion, you know, calculation per second. Mm. Or even if not that, like, thousand billion calculation per second, power up with just four pieces of banana. <laughs> we have this care robot that we have in our lab you know, nearly 200,000 pounds <laughs> running with probably like a six powerful laptop inside, like a small mm. mini computer. You think of it like power up a human brain with four pieces of banana. I think that we can't really, you know, compare <laughs> in terms of what a robot can do and what we human can do. And, and do remember this, robots are just a computing machine. So uh, it may come in any form. However, these cyber attacks that we talk about uh, uh, can be performed you know, similarly like how it is performed in a normal computer because mm. it's just a computing system. And, and uh, the, the worst part of it is the functionality and controls, if it is altered and tempered, that it can even be weaponized. When I say this, like uh, people might laugh, you know, but actually that's really true because this robot that we are talking of, like it has a hand, you know, it has a leg, it can move. So if that is the case, if I can alter its functionality, if I can control its functionality, instead of swinging right, I swing left and it ends up slapping me. Mm -hmm. you know, in, instead of walking left, I move right and it ends up kicking me. Yeah. So when I say weaponized in that regard, so if that security mechanism and method is not in place, you know, it, it can even become dangerous. Yeah. So it's very scary to think about. Uh, but that's the possibility if security measures are not in place to safeguard not only the user's data, but the system functionality and the integrity of the whole system, uh, you know, as a robot. Yeah. I mean, sci-fi has shown us many ways in which robots can be used for nefarious purposes. That's true. <laughs> I I definitely need more than four bananas to power my brain every day. <laughs> Probably that's the case, for, but uh, it seems, <laughs> you know, that's what they say. So it's very interesting finding. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Jims, it's been fascinating chatting to you today. I've been speaking to Jims Marchang, a senior lecturer and researcher at Sheffield Hallam University. Thanks, Jims. Uh, thank you for your time and the opportunity you gave me, Claire. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Robot Talk, I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast and leave a review to let us know what you think. And if you've got a question you'd like me to ask one of my future guests, you can contact us on social media at Robot Talk Pod or visit robottalk.org. Robot Talk will be taking a two-week break over the holidays, but we'll be back in January with more fascinating guests and awesome robots. When we return, I'll be chatting to Chris Dorsey from Northeastern University, all about wearable soft robots, healthcare and rehabilitation. Until then, I've been Claire Asher, and this has been Robot Talk. Robot Talk is brought to you by the Hamlin Centre, Imperial College, London.